Hello everyone, my name is Louisa and I am a content creator at Lightmap, the developers of HCR Light Studio software. Today I've had the pleasure of talking to Mike Campau, a talented and reputable digital artist based in Michigan. Let's hear more about Mike. Mike has gone through a number of experiences over the past 20 years in illustration, graphic design, photography and CGI. He's been featured on Behance over 100 times whilst on this journey, and he's not planning to stop there. With hard work and talent, Mike has earned himself a reputation of a multifaceted digital artist who loves to create images that tell stories. His powerful combination of skills allows him to create original and stunning images to elevate brands, support social causes, or just simply to express his creativity in form of art. Mike's portfolio includes campaign images for brands like Budweiser, Asics and Under Armour. Both Mike and I jumped on an online video call and we had a chat about his journey to becoming a successful digital artist, his tools, workflow, key tips and much more. I've learned a lot about Mike during this interview so without further ado, Let's get on with the video so you can listen to Mike's story and get to know him too. Enjoy. Hello. Hello. How are you? Good. You know, considering. Yeah. All that's going we on are times we live in, don't we, at the minute? Yeah. Are you... Yeah. Are you guys <clears throat> shut down? No? Yeah. We're in the lockdown at the moment. So is it Thursday yeah. today? Yeah. Since today. But surprisingly, this year has gone by so quick for me. Like, I yeah. still feel like I'm stuck in March. Yeah. I, yeah, it's, it's weird. It's almost like Groundhog Day because, you know, we went through the lockdown in March too. And I feel like we're just going to redo this all over again, but yeah. we'll see how it goes. Let's start off with you um, telling me a little bit about yourself. So tell me about your background. If I'm not mistaken, you went to two different universities. Uh, what did you study? Yeah. So I'm, well, first, Thank you for having me. Um, I've you. been a digital artist for over 20 years. When I went to school, I originally went, well, I went in fine art, sort of dabbled a little bit in everything, um, switched to scientific illustration, just uh, didn't find it very creative. It wasn't a creative outlet. Obviously, you can't be very creative with scientific illustration yeah. because you're supposed to be drawing, you know, anatomy and mm -hmm. um, surgeries for doctors. So. I switched over to graphic design, uh, but I emphasized in digital imaging while I was in the graphic design program. Um, and then that's where I really sort of dove into Photoshop, a little bit of CGI. This was early 90s, so Photoshop had just started. Uh, CGI was still pretty much in its infancy, but um, you know I had some education in it, found it really interesting, uh, but I ended up just graduating graphic design and then went on to a retouching photography studio mm. after that. Yeah. What did you do after you graduated? Did you did you dive into your uh, your field straight away or did you have a break and do something else? I took a, a small break just while I was on the job hunt, um, mm. just kind of searching around. And then, you know, a friend of mine said, oh, I know this guy who owns a retouching studio automotive retouching in Detroit. So I went and interviewed, hired on the spot, and then just started working you know, they're just doing retouching for automotive clients at the time. Um, and then that was more of a design studio as well. So, you know, a lot of graphic design, retouching, mm. um, different elements for advertising. Uh, but then we moved into, we moved that studio in to with a couple of photographers and we had like a 80,000 square foot automotive photography studio. Mm -hmm. So I got my feet wet as far as, you know, what the, the whole photography side of things and advertising and then the retouching side of things. Um, so that was right out of school. And I did that for almost 15 years. Mm -hmm. And in that period is where I started discovering CGI again and seeing how that yeah. could be used um, in that field. So after you've started discovering CGI again, did you, did you find there were any challenges that you, you were faced with? And if so, how did you overcome those um, challenges and obstacles? Yeah. When, you know, when we were starting to use it, the technology wasn't quite up to speed mm -hmm. yet to get completely photorealistic stuff. So 
we were using it for parts and pieces, you know, maybe like a tire rim or something, um, you know, to fill in, to supplement the photography or if something changed and the photo studio wasn't set up anymore. You know, we would try to do things like that. Uh, but it was a, it was a struggle because of the technology, but also because of the mindset of, um, uh, the market at the time and agencies like nobody knew what it was they didn't think it would work or it could be photorealistic enough yeah so it really made us be creative and push the technology as far as we could to uh, you know to get it to work in the photography side of things mm -hmm. in the ad agency yeah. so you said you were kind of no one really knew how everything worked exactly um do you remember when was your breakthrough moment where you started to feel like you are getting really comfortable and confident with CGI and with a combination of photography, retouching and all of that. Do you remember that moment? Yeah, actually it it was kind of a build up, but I do remember the moment where I just made a, a decision in my career that I was going to focus on photography and mm -hmm. CGI and sort of push everything else to the side. You know, I stopped doing corporate identity and gr traditional graphic design. I mean I was I enjoyed it, but I didn't love it. So I knew what I loved to do was make images. So yeah. I just really sort of jumped in and put my focus on that. And I would say um, the series of Motion and Air, mm -hmm. like my original series where I combined some CGI elements with some stock photography, really kind of pushed the recognition of my name brand and sort of elevated my career at that point because it, it went viral. It went um, it got noticed pretty well, picked yeah. up, um, got picked up by some agencies for clients. You know, they contacted me to do some similar work for theirs. So that was sort of the tipping point moment for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also think that's where all the hard work up to there started to pay off. Where yeah. I started to kind of get things, understand lighting and shadow more, more of a photographic element into the CGI world. Um, I think that was sort of the, the moment for me where I it sort of clicked and then it just you know started getting momentum and building from there yeah um so you said it's gone it's gone viral and I assume lots of hard work has gone into that in order for this to go viral um do you think you do you think it would happen again good time in good place as well did that contribute to it to uh for it to go viral um, no, I think it's, it's more of the, it speaks to the work. I yeah. think nowadays with social media and the internet, if it's something that really, um, strikes people or is different, mm -hmm. it just naturally progresses that way. If it yeah, causes sure. someone to have a reaction when they see it, mm. I think it, it sort of does it on its own. You have to put it, you have to put it out there in the right networks or the right, um, places for people to view, but at, you know, at a certain point, if the work is good or if it has the right message or, you know, just a different kind of visual, it gets picked up um, and goes viral on its own. So yeah. I think it's more that than it wasn't a it's not a strategy of mine to try to make things to go viral because like no one knows what that is yeah. until it happens. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of hard to, <laughs> I agree. Yeah, it's kind of hard to like, pl yeah, like to plan things to go viral. I mean, obviously everyone in the business and in the industry is trying to make things go viral. Yeah. Um, so again, I think it comes down to the concept and the work itself. All these years, so many years of experience, how is your life looking now? I do you find yourself um, still see it still facing challenges or any obstacles or is that in the past now um yeah i mean i think it's it's always challenges and obstacles but they're different i think um you know early in the career the challenge and obstacles is is the learning side of it mm. trying to figure out uh the the technical side where you're comfortable to where you're not thinking of those things anymore you're thinking more on the concept and the image um you know, concentrating on light and shadow composition, you know, those things, you're always kind of learning, you're always growing or crafting, uh, learning to craft your images better. Um, so I think the obstacles more now, it's less um, like, how am I going to do it? Mm -hmm. And more of the why I'm going to do it. Um, you know, what is it that I put into the image? I'm making more creative decisions on the fly faster now than earlier in my career. So, um, you know, I think there's always challenges and obstacles going forward. You know, for me, it's 
it's uh, one of the big ones is is trying to block out all the new technology and everyone talking about the new render engine mm-hmm. or the new graphics card or the new whatever um and focusing less on that and more on the craft of the image because i feel like you, i you can get wrapped up into that yeah you know, the newest and latest and and i have to constantly remind myself like it's not the graphic card that makes the image it's mm. the artist that makes mm-hmm. the image so uh, yes it has gives you maybe some slight advantages but it's not gonna you know just because you go out and buy the latest gear doesn't mean you're going to, it's just going to make the image for you. So I think that's, you know, one of the obstacles, especially now with just being bombarded by all the different Mm. companies and technology and, you know, especially real-time rendering and all that stuff that's coming into play, you know, it's, it's hard to, to sort of tune that out and focus on your craft. But I feel like for me, that's probably the biggest obstacle now is just, you know, it's the FOMO, the fear of missing out. Exactly. Yeah. But um, you know, I, I make a conscious effort to try to block that out and just focus on what I'm doing. Yeah, I 100% agree. It can be very overwhelming with, especially nowadays where everything is, everything is new still. Yeah. And it moves so fast. Very you, fast. You know, you feel like you're just always trying to catch up, but yeah. you know, that can cause anxiety in an artist thinking like, you know, I don't have the latest, I can't keep up, I can't compete with other people, but You know, I think if you focus more on your craft and what you're doing and less on how you're doing it with the technology, I think that's a better place to be in. Mm, For sure. That's a great advice, Mike. If you had to choose um, just one key to becoming a successful 3D artist, what would it be? Um, Practice. Practice. Practice and more practice. Um, You know, I think another thing... um, that I tell a lot of, you know, juniors or young artists coming up is, or a lot of people ask me, do you have a tutorial for that? Or can you show me that? And I, I'm a true believer that you should try to take that path or figure that out yourself. You know, if you see something that you like, you have to ask yourself, okay, well, why do I like it? Mm. And if you see things you don't like, ask yourself, well, why don't I like it? And if you're trying to put some of those things into your work, don't just follow somebody else's tutorial or roadmap on how they got there because you're not making those creative discoveries along the way. Um, You know, it might be good for the technical side, you know, like, Hey, I need to learn how to do this on a technical (laughs) side, but to just copy their imagery or their tutorial and then just put it out there as yours, that's, you're not making, they've already made the creative decisions for you Mm -hmm. in the tutorial. So, you know, my big thing is do tutorials for the learning, but, to have a little, um, you know, like exploration on your part mm-hmm. in order to make those creative decisions and the whys and the why nots and what looks good to you, what doesn't look good to you. And I feel like you will get further along as a digital artist if you're making those decisions as opposed to following other people's creative decisions and just becoming technically good at something. Um, yeah. Those are two different things. You know, you can be a very good technical artist, but you have no vision, no understanding of the lighting and shadow or why they did certain things. And then you're just sort of rubber stamping it. Mm. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing. A lot of the the very successful digital artists out there created their own look, created their own style. And I'm sure that came from exploration on their part. Yeah. You know, they didn't come across that just by copying other people and then all mm-hmm. of a sudden one day say oh look I got this great style that people are hiring me for you've uh, you grew quite a following on on Behance um do you think that has helped with your career is it still helping with your career to have all those followers seeing your content on a daily basis yeah absolutely I mean I I was a believer in Behance when it first came out just because of how it curated images and it Mm. curated work because it it put sort of the cream of the crop, you know, at the top visible based on how people reacted to it and um, if it was good work. Um, So for sure, I'm, I'm a huge believer in Behance and it's, it's led to, I'd say more than half of my business over Mm -hmm. the years. I mean, I think almost every, almost most of my requests start with, Hey, I saw your work on Behance, Mm -hmm. you know, into the introduction. So, um, 
yeah, I would say for sure it's it's had a major influence on my career, um, even to this day. And I would highly suggest, uh, you know, people get on it, set up profiles um, for sure. I mean, it's good to have stuff everywhere, you know, just yeah. just in case. But I'm a pretty big believer in it, just in the field that I'm in. I'm in more of the advertising, commercial work. So a lot of direct companies and agency people go there for reference and inspiration and you know, mm. they'll come across my work and that's usually how a lot of them find me. For sure. Um, with that being said, do you have any advice for other 3D artists? Uh, advise them on how they can get the work recognized a bit more or yeah, how they can I'd, stand out? Right. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, again, it, it comes with time. I would say one, like publish work when it's ready to be published. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, take, you know, all the learning and all the practices. I wouldn't put all that up there as a project. I would wait till you have something that's pretty finished or that's your best work yeah. and put it up there. And then when you put it up there, don't, don't do one-offs, um, you know, like a one image mm. and then some process, because that doesn't show that you have the capability to duplicate that mm -hmm. look or that render one time i find the projects that are in a series you know probably minimum three at least four or five uh, do way better because it shows that you were able to execute your concept or your thought you know throughout a series of of images or tell that story and then also give a little process behind it you know show some of the work in progress or some of the iterations wireframes i don't know people just love to see the screenshots of the wireframes or yeah. working files for some reason because they kind of dig into them and see uh, what was done in cgi maybe mm. what was done in post um and then and then it just when you're posting i know a lot of people will post things you know they'll post five projects in a day and then not post for a while and that doesn't really build momentum mm -hmm. i mean it's just like anything else in marketing it's better to let them leak out mm. um because if you dump them all at once, someone might not even look at two or three of them because you just dumped yeah. a whole bunch of projects at once. So they saw one or two and then they move on. So it's better to just slowly roll out a project, you know, maybe wait a week every week or, you know, whatever, however many projects you have. But I'd say those are probably the key elements to get noticed. And then obviously it's got to be good work. I mean, it, that's how the whole website's based is the more people that like it and it connects with the higher we'll get up in in viewing yeah. rankings and it, you know that's just how it works um so you know you can do all the right things on posting but if the work's not really good it's not going to get the attention it needs now you have a very unique and varied style of of work now you do a bit of uh, cgi photography and then retouching so how do you decide what approach you take on on each project? It's always based on, you know, timing, budgets, what's practical, um, and then sort of what the end look is going to be. So, yeah, can we create everything CGI and make it look photorealistic? Yes, but is, is the time and effort to put into that worth it for the outcome? Mm. Um, you know, especially if we're doing a one-off, image for advertising uh you know i'm not going to spend weeks getting this thing nailed down when i could just go in the studio in one day and shoot it and strip it in yeah. um, and get the same result so it's more of balancing those things i know there's a lot of cgi artists that take it as a challenge like oh i'm just going to create that cgi to make it real as a challenge to themselves and you know and i get that but you know in the practical commercial world they're like they have a budget they have a timeline what's the best approach to get the, the image created, you know, in that timeline with the vision and the quality that you want. So it's always a balancing act of which part you do CGI, which part you do photography, uh, how much you can put together and retouching. And, you know, I've been doing it for so many years. Mm. It's just kind of second nature when I look at a project and say, well, there's no point in doing that CGI when we can just go in a studio and shoot it and couple hours um, as opposed to me taking a week for sure and trying yeah. to get it <laughs> cgi just doesn't make you know it's just not good use of anyone's time mm. and especially in 
I'm more in the still, the still imagery um, market. So if if I was doing motion, obviously I'd have to set more of that up CGI because it would have to be captured in, in motion, and it would be harder to kind of do in camera matching and compositing, and it would just be better sometimes to do it full CGI. So um, you know, for me doing stills, I think I have more freedom to say like parts and pieces we can do and mm -hmm. shoot use CGI and other parts we can do photography, but it's just a balancing act. For sure. What yeah. 3D software do you use at the moment and what renderer? Do uh, you use any plugins as well? Um, yeah. I, I mean, I've always just been a huge Moto guy mm -hmm. just because it's what I know. Um, like the back of my hand, I've been using it for so long. Is that the first uh, 3D software that you learned? No, I go, I, over the years, when I first started, like I said, early 90s, there was, you know, uh, ForMZ and Strata Studio Pro. Those were like from way back in the day. Yeah. You know, we did some, when I was in the studio, we did some Autodesk. We had, you know, Alias and Maya. Um, I just, they were very technical and I was more of a Photoshop mm -hmm. guy. So that when I stumbled across Moto, it just, it felt natural to me you know i had a layer system it just the ui was really nice back when it first came out so i just kind of gravitated to that plus it was the first 3d that had a interactive real-time preview of what you were doing oh, so you know that's that's what got me into it and then a lot of other programs sort of caught up you know right. down the road but that was the reason i got into it um so that's my mainstay i've been doing some blender stuff too um and then my render engine's primarily B-Ray. Um, I just like the look of the render for my style yeah. um, and the type of work I do. Um, I just like the GI and the look of the GI compared to other renderers. Not that it's like the fastest or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, you know, it's just I do it as more of an artistic reason. Um, yeah. You know, I've, I've tried other ones, you know, Octane. Mm -hmm. and, um, I just, I feel like V-Ray fits, you know, my style best so that's that's what i use right now and speaking of plugins do you use any plugins and if so which ones um i mean not really i mean v-ray is technically a plugin for for moto um yeah there's not, not too many plugins i use um and then obviously the hdr light studio um connection with moto mm -hmm. um but other than i mean that's pretty much my workflow i mean if I have specialty things where I need simulations or um, something a little bit more complex, I have a you know a team of guys that I reach out to if I want simulations done or um, you know or like marvelous designer work or cloth work or um, you know I've got guys on my team that I can just reach out to and get that done. Um, I mean I could do it all myself, but I prefer not to. I prefer to be more of the person who puts it all together and does the finish because yeah. that's strong point. You know, same with modeling and all that too. I mean, I, it's what I, I can't stand modeling. I can do it, but it's not, you know, it's more of a, it's more of the engineering technical yeah. side. <clears throat> it's not, um, it's not something I enjoy doing and I can do it and I'll muscle through it, but I'd prefer to just team up with somebody who can like do those things all day super fast. And it just, it gives me time to do what I do. And then it just, um, it's more beneficial for my clients, mm. you know, on time and budget as opposed to just trying to like do it all myself and, and drag it out. For sure. So you said you don't really like modeling um, when compared to other elements or processes of 3D. Um, but in your opinion, what's the hardest process of 3D in general? So like modeling, for example, texturing, lighting, or anything else? Is, is there an element where you think, I'm weaker in this element, in this process than the other. Yeah. I mean, I would say like, for sure it's the, it's the modeling mm -hmm. uh, just because I don't love to do it. So obviously I'm not going to put all my efforts and dive into, uh, you know, the modeling side of it. And I also think, um, you know, material setups are, can be pretty complicated. There's a lot of presets and things people drag and drop, but if you really want to get into, um, you know, making a material right for what you're looking for mm -hmm. to make it photorealistic. Uh, there's a lot more uh, details to get into it, more research. Um, so that part's difficult. The lighting part's probably the easiest for me just because the photography background yeah. and retouching background. So that part 
I can kind of make up for some of my shortcomings in other areas by doing really good lighting mm -hmm. and scene and composition um, to where maybe that's not needed, um, you know, at the, at the level that some other people could do it. Mm -hmm. So speaking of lighting, when did you first hear about HDR Light Studio? Um, actually, I, I think it was right around, I mean, you guys started about 10 years ago, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, I think that's right. it's probably shortly, yeah, probably shortly after that. And I've always been intrigued by it. I just never, um, I just never had a use for it mm -hmm. for the type of work I was doing initially. Um, but then, you know, over the past few years, I've been doing a lot more product work, mm -hmm. uh, more product beauty work. So, um, you know, I, I dove in one of another artist that I work with had been using it beforehand and he'd always send over the HDR files mm -hmm. that output, which just got me interested. And I'm like, well, I'll, I'll give it a try. And then, um, now I start, now I use it for my product stuff, um, just because it helps me uh, just move faster. Um, I, it's all the stuff I can do in the program. Mm -hmm. It's just, that helps me just work faster yeah. uh, to get there. That's yeah. great. Speaking of HDR Light Studio, does it fulfill your needs? What features are your favorite yeah. features? I like that it's tied into the actual program. Mm -hmm. So when I'm in Moto and I have my real-time render preview and V-Ray, like it, it's all linked together. Yeah. So as I'm making creative decisions and moving lights around, you know, it's giving me instant feedback. So, you know, that part I love about it. I mean, that's the whole reason I added it, you know, to my arsenal uh, my process and my pipeline but um you know and i and then obviously the light painting and clicking on the object that's um i think that's what everyone loves about it it's very easy to sort of start placing lights and then once you get it in an area mm. you can tweak it um you know i like the instant you know able to rotate and widen and change the width and heights of lights like pretty quickly yeah. and easily with sliders um it's a little more intuitive than grabbing handles and doing it that way um so I'd say for sure those are probably the, the key reasons that I even like, added it to my toolbox. That's great. Um, yeah. So because of your photography background, uh, you'll be in a good position to have a say in this. So now that you've got some experience with HDR Light Studio, do you think um, our software, so HDR Light Studio helps with uh, understanding or learning the art of lighting? Is it a good tool for learning how to improve your lighting techniques? Um, yeah, I think I think it can. It, it might be a little confusing for mm -hmm. someone who hasn't been in a photo studio to correlate it to the photography yeah. side. So they, they would learn it. It almost would be a, like a 3D view of photography mm -hmm. and learning lighting that way. Um, you know, I can relate it, you know, when I bring a softbox in or a reflector dish or, you know, I know what the difference of those lightings can be in a studio environment. And to bring them into 3D, they're like slightly different, but pretty much the same, yeah. you know, outcome as far as shadow quality and stuff. So, um, you know, I, I think they can learn photography techniques, but it might not translate to the real world to them unless they get into a photo studio and actually do it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just, it's a different environment, you know, when you're doing virtual lighting compared to real lighting, there's some nuances that are a little different mm. you have to. Um, sort of know those or adjust for those, which is what I do when I shoot for projects to composite together. I know when I'm in studio and the type of modifier I'm using in studio and how that translates into the 3D software. And if that's a point light or an area light mm. or a directional light or, you know, what modifiers will be similar or the same so that when you put them together, it looks like it's one shot. Do you have any favorite projects that you like to work on? Um, the next one is always the favorite project. The next one. Uh, yeah, the next project is always the favorite project. But, um, you know, I love doing uh, collaboration projects mm -hmm. where I'm working with other artists or mainly photographers because I feel like it helps elevate my work mm -hmm. or it builds in this sort of team making an image as good as it can be. Yeah. Um, and then you have somebody else that's kind of pushing you and you're bouncing ideas back and forth. So I'd say the, the collaboration projects are by far my favorite, um, especially if I'm in charge of the CGI digital side of it, they're in charge of the photography side of it. Mm -hmm. Because I 
they can go in studio and come back to, with something that's completely different than I was thinking. Mm-hmm. And it's sort of those those wow moments or those shock moments that you kind of give each other or yeah. the photographer will send me an image and I'll send it back to him. And he's like, whoa, I would didn't even, you know, think of that, you know, or, or wasn't thinking that way, but it's really cool. So those are the projects I find the most rewarding and usually the ones that um, probably are some of my best work or the collaborations for sure. Nice. That's very true. I myself like to bounce off of, you know, team members and I, I feel like, yeah, it does improve work. Um, it's all yeah. about the feedback and discussing your ideas and having to explain them, your thought process as well. So that all helps. Yeah. And especially in a visual world, you know, you have something in your mind's eye and you go to put it together. But if you give that same concept and idea to someone else and then they send it back to you visually, mm-hmm. Like it's always going to be different. I mean, yeah. they have a different point of view. So it's it's pretty nice because then it kind of opens up like, oh, I didn't think of that. And then you might roll with like, well, now that I'm thinking the way they are and then yeah. you add your twist to it and it just kind of builds. So that's the process that I like the most. Definitely. Sure. Um, speaking yeah. of the subject of the project, so like cars, products, makeup, do you have a favorite? Um. No longer cars because I did automotive for 15 years and I don't want to see another car. <laughs> you know, like, um, you know I, I like consumer goods for some reason. I don't know why I just sort of gravitated toward mm-hmm. that recently. Um, I think it's it's because I can get in studio and shoot and then as well get in the computer and sort of play off of um, – the best of both worlds and you know if i want to do something against the laws of physics i can do it cgi and then if i want to bring some surprise photo element to it um i can do that so Mm -hmm. i'd say you know recently those are probably as far as commission work that's probably where i'd say it's it's at but you know for me doing personal projects that's always just like open to anything or it's more about the concept um so those those are the projects that I really enjoy doing too, just the more of a creative outlet yeah. um, and to get away from, you know, like product sales mm. type stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd say that between those two. How would you like to progress as an artist further? Do you have set goals, challenges that you would like to accomplish or are you at the um, point where you're fully satisfied with, with your achievements and, and you're just, yeah, just going. Yeah, I don't think I'd ever be satisfied um, as far as my work is concerned. Mm-hmm. Sort of where I'm at in my career, I'm pretty satisfied where I'm at. But my work, I'm always trying to improve. Um, and whether that's, you know, just learning new things or trying out different techniques or working with different artists or photographers, um, those are always my goal is to improve the work. I don't necessarily have a goal as far as, you know, like number of clients or types of projects I'm going to work on yeah. or, um, you know, like the recognition thing. I don't want to become Instagram famous. Like I, that, that's not my thing. You know, I, I worry more about the work and sort yeah. of improving an artist and, and just sort of getting as good as I can be at my craft. Mm. Uh, so that's more of my goal. So that's more of an everyday goal. You know, you just wake up and you're just trying to get better every yeah. time you work on something. Um, and over time, and you know, like I said in the very beginning, it's practice, practice, practice. So I'm still, you know, I'm working on stuff and it's technically me just practicing, getting better for the next project. So every project I work on, I, you know, I see things slightly different. I do things a little bit better. I get more efficient. Um, so those are the things that, those are always just my goals, mm. like every time. Yeah. So like you say, you've got goals. And I think that's that's really important um, to focus on your craft and have goals to always improve. Because I feel like there's this possibility if you don't have any goals or you're just fully satisfied, you might start losing the passion for your craft. Do you think? Right. Do you think that could be true? Yeah. Yeah. And I plus I also feel um, I see a lot of artists that will get stuck sort of in a rut or they start echoing their work like over and over to the point where uh, you know for me that wouldn't be satisfying to keep echoing the same visuals over and over again in different scenarios Um, and I think you can as an artist get 
burnout, but also your, your audience or, you know, the public will get kind of burned out mm. of seeing it as well. Like no matter how many times you can do a variation of that look, you know, it's still the same, it's still the same visual. It's the same concept. Um, so for me, I always try to not echo something I've done in the past. And if I do, I want to try to like put a new twist on mm. it or something that I, that I see differently now or a, a new technique that I feel worked better for that type of uh, image. So that, you know, for me, that's also, you know, part of the goal too, is to, to not just keep repeating myself, but to, to get better. And just to close things off and have a nice closing message for other 3D artists, do you have like the biggest tip for, could be a, a beginner 3D artist or aspiring 3D artist? What would be your biggest tip or advice to them for the future? Um, so the advice I give mm -hmm. to um, a lot of juniors, I do a lot of portfolio reviews for college, high school students too. And, um, and I always say the personal project is the, probably the biggest differentiator between being a good artist and a, becoming an excellent one. And, and there's a few reasons for that. Cause one, you're in charge of the whole vision, right? Two, you're probably picking something that you love or you are interested in, or you like, so you're going to be motivated that way. Um, but more, it shows people how you think in your process and you're not just executing part of a vision or a client's vision mm. or someone's coming to you saying here just do this and you're just spitting it out and then that's how you learn how to create images on your own because you're not having people telling you what to do or the creative motivation behind it or giving you the concept and you're just executing so it's a hard it's hard to start doing those um especially early in your career, because like I said, you're still trying to learn all the technical stuff. You're trying to learn the hows um, and not so much concentrating on the why, which is usually the personal project. Um, but I would say for sure to always keep trying those because the more and more of those you do, the better you'll get. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of the practice, you know, like in sports, you just don't pick up a basketball and then go to the NBA, you know, like yeah. the first day you pick it up. Um, <laughs> You know, so it's the same thing. You have to kind of start. And then the other thing is when you're doing these projects is don't spend so much time worrying about the thinking or the concept behind it. You know, mm. sometimes people will try to brainstorm and come up with the best concept possible before they actually start working. My advice is to just do a list of concepts and just pick one and jump in and start doing it. Because I find once you're in the creative moment and you're creating and things are happening that's usually when sort of those little sparks of moments of magic happen um because you're you're in there doing stuff and then you might see something that you're like oh well that's a little bit different mm. or it might swerve you away from your concept but it's taking you down a road that's even better or that you recognize as better um and you would never have found that out if you were just sitting there trying to you know brainstorm the mm. concept it's it's more of the it's better to do than to think um sort of philosophy and, and it took me a while to learn that i used to think oh, i have to have the perfect concept and have it all thought out mm. before i get started um and sometimes it's better to, to just do it i know a lot of photographers who will just they have an idea but they'll just get in studio and sort of play and same thing like mm. all of a sudden they're like oh wait i didn't you know that turned out pretty interesting i didn't even think of that and those moments would never happen if you didn't just jump in and start doing it. So that that would definitely be my number one advice to even senior artists who are sort of finding themselves in a rut or they're stuck executing other people's mm. ideas. Like get out and like take on a personal project and 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 sort of see how that feels and get out of your comfort zone. And uh, sometimes like you'll just create things that you weren't expecting to create. That's a very interesting angle and advice in general, yeah. Rather than yeah. think about it too much, just just do it. I think, yeah, what right. you just said, I think it yeah. applies for everything in life. Yeah, and, and especially, you know, and a lot of it's a fear factor too for people, you know, like the, they let the fear make their decision to not do things yeah. sometimes or they're afraid to get started. Mm. And sometimes just getting started alleviates that fear because then you get into the moment and you're like, oh, I'm doing this, I can kind of, 
do this. Like, yeah, you might fail, you know, it might be miserable, but at least you got like moving. And then the next time it just becomes easier to do it. And then it just kind of snowballs. So like each time you do it, it just gets a little bit easier and then it gets a little bit better too. So definitely that would be my advice. Yeah. Thank you for all of that, Mike. Uh, it's been very nice talking to you and uh, yeah, we appreciate the time. It's been lovely. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank for you. Sure. Hopefully thanks. we can do this again sometime. Yeah, I'm sure we can. Yeah. Thank I'm you. I'm free. I'm here. <laughs>